Hi everyone, welcome to Last Minute Maths again. In this video, we're going to have a walkthrough of the solutions to this paper, this uh, Maths at Excel, uh, paper 2, June 2020. And uh, I've got the solutions in there already, so we're going to run through it as quickly as possible. As always, before I start, just to remind you, if there are any particular topics or a particular paper or question even that you want me to go through, then just drop it in the comments and I'll try and turn it around as quickly as possible. And another thing, before we do start, um, go and get a strong coffee, right? Because going through a maths paper solutions is about as exciting as watching paint dry. So you might need some caffeine. I'm going to try and make this short and sweet, so let's just uh, jump straight in. All right, so the first question, um, product of prime factors. <clears throat> Excuse me. I think you all know this. Um, just keep dividing whatever number they've got there. And in this case... Uh, hang on, let me just do that. Yep, all right. So you've got your 84, all right? And even number, so the first prime, 2. Another even, 2 again. And then next one, 21, 3, and 7, all right? So two ways of writing this. You can write it 2 times 2 times 3 times 7, or in index form. So this one is the index form. All right, and either way, uh, you get the marks for that. Next bit, uh, find the lowest common multiple, all right? Now, this one is important. Um, often people get this bit wrong. The lowest common multiple is actually better written as the highest common factor times all other factors from both numbers. just to remind you of the theory. So in this case, we've got uh, the pairing. So 2 and 2. So that pairs up. That's this one here. And then you've got another 2 and another 2. So that one pairs up. And then the 3 and the 3. So that's a pair there. So those are those three numbers there. Okay. Don't count them twice. Each pair is one number, so the two is a pair of twos, all right? And then what you have left is five on this side, seven on that side. So it's the highest common factor, the two times the two times the three, and then times the five on this side and the seven there, all right? So all the unused factors will be multiplied after, and that gives a total there, all right? Okay, right, next one, number two. Universal set, that's E, there. Okay, that is all the integer digits 1 to 10. All right. A, the set A is all the even numbers. So that's going to be your 2, 4, 6, 8, 10. And B are factors of 10. All right. So if we populate the actual Venn diagram, then you've got A with 4, 6, and 8 on the outside, because they're not factors of 10, all right, so those. In B, factors of 10 are 1, 10, 5, and 2. The even numbers also belong in A, and then 5 and 1 are left over as odd numbers, which are also factors of 10. There you go. And the unused numbers, the ones that don't belong in A or B, are the external ones there, all right? Now, this is a probability question, this next part, part B. Probability um, that a number chosen at random all right, from the whole set is in the set A intersection B. All right? This means it's in A and B at the same time. All right? So the only two that are in A and B at the same time are 2 and 10. So that's two numbers out of a total of 10. Right, from the universal set, remember. Two tenths becomes one fifth. All right? Okay, nice and simple. This one is a little more challenging, number three. Uh, just a little bit of working to do. All right? And there are different ways to approach this. Most important thing, right? Uh, most common mistake is not reading the question carefully. Read it twice if you have to. 
All right. So there's going to be uh, cans or tins, rather, he says, into small boxes and big boxes. Six in a small box, 20 in a large box. All right. So this is important data. In the actual exam, underline the important data if you have to. Right, so that you don't miss it and you don't forget to use the information they give you. Next thing it says, 3,000 tins altogether. All right? Number of tins in small boxes and number of tins in large boxes is two to three. All right? This is important. It's a ratio of tins, not boxes. That, again, is a common mistake. All right? So remembering our ratio stuff, Total of five parts, if you think of it that way, all right? So if we were to divide the 3,000 tins into five parts, you get 600 tins in each part, okay? So in the small boxes, there are two parts, right? So 1,200 tins are going to be in small boxes, and tins in the large boxes is going to be 1,800, three parts, all right, times 600 each. Now, before moving on, right, that's not the end of the question. The point being, this gives you the ratio of tins, but we have to convert to boxes. Because the question actually asks for 30% of the boxes filled with tins are large boxes. That's what they're saying. All right? So <clears throat> converting that back into boxes now, number of small boxes, because there are 1,200 tins, divided by six in each box, 200, all right? There. Number of large boxes, it's going to be 1,800 tins divided by 20. So 20 in each box gives us 90 boxes. So 200 small boxes and 90 large boxes. Now, the proportion, therefore, the fraction of large boxes to the total is 90 over 290. All right, so the total was 290, remember. And 9 over 29, it's a calculated paper, so you're welcome to use that, convert it into that. And remember, 30% is the same as 0 0.3, and this is therefore larger. So he is incorrect. All right, I hope that's uh, fairly clear. All right, moving on. Number four, complete the table of values, right? And I think most people can do that. Just one worked example here. When x equals minus 2, all right, you've got to be careful about the sign, all right? So it means 5 minus, and then minus 2 cubed, all right? That means 5 minus minus 8, because minus 2 cubed equals minus 8, right? Be careful about the sign. Don't forget that. And so the thing comes out to be 5 plus 8, all right? So that's 13. In similar fashion, you do x equals 0, x equals 1, and x equals 2. I hope there's no problem with that. And then you plot the points, all right? So there's one there, all right? And then you've got the minus 1 there, all right? 6, 0, x equals 1, and x equals 2. And then just do your best in a sharp pencil in the actual exam. All right? Use a clean, sharp pencil. Very important. And try and do just a smooth line connecting all the points. Remember, it is a cubic. All right? So if it's a cubic curve... X3 means it's a cubic. So it's going to be up at one end, down at the other, with a little sort of like a, a change of direction in the middle. All right. Okay. Number five, a bit of trigonometry. Work out the value of X, all right? So that's your height there. Remember, in this uh, particular triangle, if that's the angle that we're talking about here, then that is the opposite, all right? And using our Sokotoa, 
Okay, sine is opposite over hype, cos adjacent over hype, and tangent is opposite over adjacent. All right, and that's your hypotenuse there. So we can write it like this: sine thirty-four would be the opposite over the hypotenuse. So opposite being x, and hypotenuse is 178 millimeters. Rearranging it, bringing that over here, all right, to get x on its own, it's 178 times sine 34, and you get the number there. It says one decimal place, so just cutting it there, rounding it to 99.5. Remember the units, all right? Make sure you write in the units. Okay. Vectors. Um, column vectors, all right? In this case, it's simply, it's just multiply uh, each of the vectors by the coefficients, so 2 and 3 in this case. So it's 2 times A, all right, minus 3 times B, all right? So that's 2 times 3, that way, 2 times 4 gives you 6 and 8 for the first one, and then 3 times 5, 15, 3 times minus 2, minus 6, and then the thing is just a standard addition. 6 minus 15 minus 9, all right? So just going across like that. And 8 minus minus 6, watch out for the sign again. So it's 8 plus 6, 14. And writing it out as a column vector, as they've suggested, all right? Okay, number 7. Again, a little bit of thought and reading the questions carefully, all right? Uh, right angle triangle, so we have that there, watch out. And then there's a right angle at the sector. This is a sector of a circle. All right. And again, 90 degrees there. So they've actually said it in the question, quarter circle. All right. And um, let's see, is there anything else we need on there? No. The area of the quarter circle. In order to find the quarter circle... Right, we need to find the area of the circle itself and then take a fraction. So, oh, it's under there. So, I know the angle of sector over 360. So, that gives us a fraction of the circle that we want. times the area of the circle. All right? Now, that bit's nice and easy. The angle of the sector is 90. The bit that we need to work out is the area of the circle. All right? And for that, we need the R, value of R. Okay? That's the important bit. All right, so to find R, we're going to use Pythagoras. Okay? Because we know the hypotenuse and we know one of the short sides. So, under normal circumstances, you just add r squared plus 6 squared would equal 9 squared. Rearranging a little. All right? And we get... 81 minus 36 equals 45. So R squared equals 45. We don't actually need to work out R, i.e. the square root of 45 in this case, because for the area of the circle, we want pi R squared. So we can just take that straight down, put it there. 45 pi is the area of the circle. Now, applying what we've just done up there with the angle of the sector, the area of the quarter circle is effectively a quarter times 45 pi. Calculator again, and 3SF. Watch out, they've said that in the question. Okay, and also show all your working. So write down as much as you want. Um, be sensible with your time, but make sure you write down everything. You don't want to lose a method mark um, along the way somewhere. So 3SF starting with one, two, three. 
All right, so those three numbers is what we want. And cutting it off there, it rounds to 35.3. And uh, the units, they've already put the units, so you don't need to worry about that. All right, four marks. That's a decent amount of working, but make sure you put all your workings down. Right, now, this one, um, percentages. Tarek buys a laptop, gets 5% discount of the normal price, and he pays 551. So this is actually a reverse percentage question. All right. Now, the important thing is, after 5% discount, what you're left with is 95% of the original value. All right. So if you use what's called the multiplier method, if you've forgotten that, I suggest uh, going back, taking a look at it. It means a single number. The multiplier is this thing here. All right. It's a single number times whatever I started with that gives me the actual final result. So this time we're going backwards. So this P is the original price. All right. So 95% of P is 551. All right. So rearrange 551 divided by 0 0.95. That is 580. All right. The common mistake is to say, ah, I've got 95% of something. So if I take you know, 5% of 551 and add it on, right? Uh, that'll get me back to 100%. That is wrong. Don't do this. All right, it's got to be the reverse percentage method. All right, then we have a uh, compound interest question, all right? With a little bit of a twist. Look what it's got. It's got a change. in percentage rate, all right? So I've written it out in a lot of detail here just to uh, make sure everything's clear, um, but there is a shortcut and I'll show that at the end. So what you can do after the first year, or right, the multiplier, it's 100% plus 2.4%. That's what you've got for the first year here, all right? So effectively, at the end of the first year, you've got 102%, sorry, 102.4%, which, if you convert it into decimals, 1.024, right? Watch out for that, okay? So after the first year, 6,000 times 1.024, 6,144, okay? Now, compound means that in the subsequent year, following years, you're putting interest on top of your total amount, okay? Not the basic 6,000, but the whole amount, whatever it is that you end the first year with, you're putting interest on top of that. So the second year, the multiplier, using the same method, all right, is 1.7%, so it's 101.7% is your total, and that is 1.017, okay? Now, extending that, what I've just said about uh, the, the compound interest, interest on interest is what it means. So second and third year, you're starting the second year with 6144 times 1.017% at the, well, sorry, the 1.7% that is, so 1.017 at the end of the second year. So that's your second. And then again, 1.017 after the third year. All right? So that can be expressed like this. 6144 times 1.017 squared, and it gives you this. Because it's a pound question, money question, the pennies count. You need to put those in. All right? For those of you who are uh, quite au fait with this particular type of question, we could have done it in literally one step. All right? So the final amount... would have been given by 6,000 times 1.024 
times 1.017 squared, all in one go. And that would have given us exactly the same number. So that's the shortcut method. Both methods, whether you write out all that amount or you just do this one here, right, will still get you the three marks. So up to you which one you're more confident with. Okay, next question, number nine. <clears throat> uh, centimeters of, like, heights in centimeters. Information on the table, all right, here. So not fully correct. Okay, let's just check through what it's got. Um, 142 for the least height, so that's your least, and that one's okay, 142. And then it's got the lower quartile, right, which is this one here, the lower quartile. Sorry, trying to squeeze that in. And 154, that's correct, all right, so that's okay. And the Median, let's just check the median there, All right? That should be there. That's the median. And so that one is your first mistake. Should be 162, not 161. And then uh, range is 40, so from 142 uh, up to, oh, here we go, uh, 182. So that's correct, All right? So the highest value. So that one's fine, 182. <clears throat> and so the other mistake is that if you take a look at the lower quartile and you add the interquartile range, right? Upper quartile equals lower quartile plus the interquartile range, right? Hope you understand the shorthand. So that should be 154 plus interquartile range 17, 171, all right? Not 172. So the two mistakes, median uh, should be 162, not 161, and the upper quartile should be 171, not 172, all right? Simple, two marks. Okay, number 10, all right? Now, this one just looks worse than it actually is. Remember any number to the power zero, all right, is one, all right? So, I don't know, you could take 17.5 to the power zero, it's still one, okay? Whatever you like uh, to the power zero is one. Nothing more to say on that one. This one is writing the denominator in its square form. So it's like x minus 4 times x minus 4. Right, write it out in two forms there, and then you'll see that the top x minus four and one from the bottom cancels. All you're left with is eight and an x minus four, hence the answer there. All right, nice and simple, only one mark. Right, finally, simplify. Remember the rule a to the power x, all of it, all to another power, right, expanding that you multiply the powers. So it'll be a to the power x times y, all right? That rule there. So what happens is you're effectively multiplying each of the powers in the question itself by 3. When we have a 3 on its own, that means it's 3 to the power 1 times 3, so 3 to the power 3. Then n to the power 4 times 3, w to the power 2 times 3, okay? Expanding all that out, you get 3 to the power 3 is 27, times n to the 12, times w to the power 6. Hopefully that's all explanatory. Okay, uh, next one. Jack is in a restaurant. There are five starters, eight main courses, and a number of desserts we don't know, all right? And... Um, is going to choose, like, you know, one of those combination type questions. One starter, one main course, and one dessert. Okay? And he says there are 240 ways. Okay? Is he right? So, for the starter, you've got a choice of five. 
And then for each of those, you've got a choice of a main course, all right? So the main, choice of eight, and then a choice of desserts, which we don't know, all right? And if we want to make it equal to 40, all right, D would equal, i.e. the number of desserts, 240 over 40, there'd have to be six desserts. So he could be correct, right? Because the question says, could Jack be correct? Could be correct if there are six desserts. And that's actually the answer to the question. All right. Okay. For those of you still awake, and we'll carry on. Question 12. Right. The graph gives information about the volume, V liters, of petrol in the tank of uh, Jim's car after it's traveled a distance of D kilometers. All right. Well, given these days, he probably wouldn't have the money to buy any petrol, so the whole point is right, rather meaningless. He's not going to be driving anywhere. Um, anyway, joking aside, volume on the vertical, and you've got the distance along the bottom, and you see a negative gradient, right? So negative gradient. Okay. Um, that means the amount of petrol, the volume, is decreasing, right? It's decreasing as the distance increases, which is fairly obvious. That's what's going to happen. You're going to use up the petrol as you drive further and further. Finding the gradient of the graph, right? Remember the formula for gradient? Take any two points. I've chosen the point here and the point here because they give me... Uh, integer numbers, so I've tried to pick whole numbers. All right, so you've got um, that distance, right, from there to there. It's a uh, hundred. And the height is going from 18 up to 27 there. All right, so that's actually nine going up and down. So the gradient is the y difference. over the x difference between two points on a line, all right? And as I've just said, 18 minus 27, all right? And there's a reason I put that in that way, because it's actually a negative gradient. You've got to make sure you get it negative, all right? And so that gives us minus 9, and 100 kilometers is the um, x direction, and therefore, you're getting minus 0 0.09 liters per kilometer, right? Interpret what the gradient of the graph represents. It's basically how much petrol is used per kilometer of driving, right? Or you could write the decrease in volume of petrol in tank for each kilometer driven. Something to that effect, as long as it's a sensible statement showing that it is a change of the volume, all right, and that it's uh, decreasing. That's sufficient. Right, number 13, triangle. Okay, whenever you see an irregular triangle and You've got angles and sides. Straight away, you should think sine rule, cos rule, etc. All right? And in this case, they want us to work out this side here, AB. All right? So we have to go through a little bit of a process here. We know from the two angles given, right, from there and there, that this angle here actually turns out to be 120, all right? And we can then, because we've got one side and an angle connected, right? Remember, it's opposite sides to an angle is how you use the sine rule, okay? So A over sine A equals B over sine B, C over sine C, so in each case, it's the side opposite 
the angle. Okay, right, so in this case we've got AB would connect to that 34 there. All right, uh, let's. Okay, so the AB is connected to that 34. So AB over sine 34 would be the 23.8 over sine 120. All right, rearranging again, bring that over here. Multiply out the denominator on the other side, and you get a straightforward equation. Make sure, please, your calculator is set to degrees. All right. Before the exam, check your calculator. Make sure it hasn't got any funny settings on it. All right. So, again, one decimal place. So, do that, and you get... 15.4. All right. Next question. A bit of algebra and a bit of logic. All right. Two squares. So straight away we know that uh, the sides are going to be x and x and x plus 4 for that. The question says the length of each side of square B, right, is 4 centimeters greater than the length of each side of square A. You know, and that's where we get the x plus 4 from. If A has side x, then B will have side x plus 4. All right. The area of B, 70 centimeters greater than the area of square A. So let's just go through and methodically, and this is where you've got to lay out your work properly. All right. Lay out your workings clearly and fully. Right, really important point, and I'm going to actually write this, okay? Make the examiner, i.e. the person marking it, your friend, okay? I Honestly, I'm not joking. Make things clear and easy to follow, and you're more likely to get a sympathetic response from an examiner in case, you know, something is missing, whatever, and they'll give you the benefit of the doubt, okay? Make it messy, entangled, you know, like a drunken spider sort of like scratched all over the screen or whatever. Don't do that because that really annoys them, okay? When they've got two, three hundred papers to mark of an evening, they don't want to spend half an hour trying to... Uh, decipher one question. So lay everything out, label everything. Label every single step that you're doing, all right? Okay, now getting down to the question itself. The area of A, we know straightforward, is x squared, fine. The area of B, we know is x plus 4 squared, all right, because it's a square, and that gives us that expression there, all right? Um, we then know that the area of B, that one, is area of A plus 70, all right? So that's where we're getting, whoops, that's where we're getting that statement from, okay? That 70 is the extra bit. And if you rearrange all of this, look, the x squared cancels on both sides, and the 70, um, leave it where it is, take the 16 over, Right, minus 16, so you get 54, equals the 8x, because that's left over. And uh, if you want using your calculator, x equals 6.75. Right, so we have value for x. The question actually asks for area of square b. All right, so the area of b, bung it back into the formula for b, which was x plus 4 all squared. So 6.75, as we just found, plus 4, 10.75 squared, and it gives you a weird-looking number like that. What you need from there, right, three significant figures, so just those three there, right? And that, if you cut it there, the next one is a 5, so 116, all right? Okay, hope you're all okay with that one. Next one. Um... Not actually too difficult. I'm not going to dwell on this one too much. Whenever you want to find 
um, an enlargement, right? First of all, now I, I will say this one, not a rotation because the sizes are different. Okay, make sure you note that. If they were the same size, it could have been a rotation. But because the sizes are different, if you look at that and look at that, right, it cannot be a rotation, all right? So it's got to be an enlargement, but on like opposite sides of a center of enlargement. Remember an enlargement, you need three bits of information. First of all, that it is an enlargement. You need a scale factor and you need a center, okay? I'll talk about the scale factor and center. The way to do the enlargement thing is take what we call corresponding corners of a shape, right? So look at this one. This is the right angle corner there. That matches with that one there, right? Like that. Connect, right, draw a straight line. Use a decent ruler, okay? None of the ones with chips and little kinks in it and things missing. Good ruler and straight line, okay? from one matching corner to the other matching corner, all right? And do that for at least two. Usually two will be enough, okay? So you can see how we've done that. And those two lines go through this point here. They intersect at one, one. That is your center of enlargement, okay? So that's where we're getting this one, one from in the answer. The next thing, is the scale factor. First of all, the size, the actual number, right? Your original, take this one side here, okay? Up here. That's got two squares vertically, all right? The same side, okay, over here has three, okay? So your scale factor is always your image, over your original, all right? In this case, it's three over two. So that's where we get the three over two from. And then the negative is because it's on the opposite side of the center, of the center of enlargement. Okay? Because it's on the opposite side, it's negative. That's where the minus 3 over 2 comes from. You need all three uh, bits of information in order to get the full marks. All right. Okay, the next one. This one, I think, is one that people have different methods to do. A quadratic sequence. All right. I'll show you my way of doing it. And obviously, if you have another method that you're comfortable with, follow that. Um, or if anybody wants an explanation further on this, then again, please drop it in the comments. Okay, um, we know that the sequence is 10, 21, 38, 61, 90. So the differences between the numbers are not the same. Okay, we expect that because we're told it's quadratic. So 11, 17, 23, 29. Then the next difference, i.e. the second difference, is 6 in each case. So that's constant. And here's the rule. A quadratic sequence will have an nth term which is given by a quadratic form of n. So a n squared plus b n plus c. The special rule about the a, right? That's this thing here. a is always half the second difference. Okay, whatever the second difference is, A will be half, all right, always. That's just a rule, you know, learn it, memorize it, and use it. Don't worry about Y or anything like that. Okay, therefore, um, using A equals 3 from this um, rule here, you've got 3N squared plus BN plus C, all right, that's the general form. What we then need to do is use two values of N, 
n equals 1. All right. Remember, n is a position value. So in other words, n equals 1 means the first term. Right? That's 10. Okay? So 3 times 1 squared plus 6 times... Sorry, my apologies. I can't read my own writing. B times 1. That's B. Okay? B times 1 plus C. So effectively, that simplifies to this thing here. B plus C equals 7 because it's 10 minus the 3 there. Okay? So b plus c equals 7. And then the next one, n equals 2. 2 squared, that's 4 there, and a 2 there, and c. So 3 times 4, 12, plus 2b plus c. So 12 plus 2b plus c equals 21. And minus the 12 from both sides, you get 9 on this side. 2b plus c equals 9. All right? Now, you could actually do it like simultaneous equations, but here's a simple point of observation, all right? Between these two equations or statements, um, all we've done is added 1b, yeah? There's just one extra b. Everything else is exactly the same. So whatever the difference is going from 7 to 9, which is a plus 2, must be because of the b. Oops, hang on. Must be the value of b. Okay, so b equals 2, and if you look at the first equation, b plus c equals 7, so 2 plus c equals 7, c must equal 5. All right, so that gives us our nth term. All right. And that's 3n squared plus 2n, which is the b, and c is the 5. All right? You could uh, use n equals 3 and see if the value equals 38 as a test to make sure you've got it correct. Um, only if you have time. Otherwise, don't bother. If you push for time, don't worry. Just get through that method, and you've got the answer there. Okay, uh, next thing. Write down the coordinates of the turning point on the graph that. This is completing the square, so it's a completed square form. All right, if you have x uh, plus, I'm going to put a plus here as a reason to illustrate something special here, Q, all right? It is a rule that if you have it in that form, these two numbers are very important, okay? The turning point, i.e. the means the minimum or maximum, okay? So either that or that point there, all right? is given by minus p q. Really important, okay? Um, the number within the brackets, right? If it's plus p or whatever, reverse the sign. So if it's uh, plus 2, it becomes minus 2. If it's minus 3, it becomes plus 3. So the one inside the brackets, reverse the sign. So there, reverse sign. For the x coordinate of the turning point and the q, right, this thing here stays same, same sign. All right, so that's why we've got the plus 12 becoming a minus 12 and the minus 7 stays the same. All right, same sign. Hope that's clear. All right. Next one. Now we're getting into a little bit more involved types of questions. Okay. Not long to go. I'll try and be as quick as I can with these. Um, right. Okay. Solid cone. All right. And in this, we're going to use um, the rule about 
uh, like similar triangles. Okay. So again, important information. Base diameter of 20, so the radius is 10. Okay. And a slant height in total of 25. So that's where we get this from, the 15. All right. It's 25 minus the 10 here. All right. Circle is drawn around the surface of the cone, slant height of 10 above the base. All right. So that's all in the diagram. Work out the area of the curved surface, curved surface only of the cone that is not painted gray. So you don't need the flat base. All right. And it's not painted gray. We are so used to seeing questions saying, what's the area of the shaded region or whatever it might be? This one's the opposite. It's not gray, so please watch out for that. Don't fall into the trap. Okay, so what we're going to do, using similar triangles, all right, we're going to uh, get the area, surface area of the whole cone, all right, so the entire big cone, and then find the surface area curved surface area of the shaded cone and taking one away from the other will leave us with the white bit at the bottom okay right uh, similar triangles rule okay so we know that the radius of the shaded cone right which is this one here radius there that radius over 15 all right should be the same as 10 over the whole thing there, which is 25, okay? And using that uh, ratio, right, R over 15 equals 10 over 25 because they're based on the same angle here, all right? And R we find is six uh, centimeters. Okay, so therefore, the surface area of the large cone Using the rule up in the corner, make sure you use this, all right? So pi times r times l, right? Radius of the large cone is 10, so straightforward, 250 pi, all right? And then the surface area of the small cone, right? the shaded one, okay? That's radius of 6, r equals 6, and the slant length if you like is 15 okay 90 pi all right so you got that and therefore the unshaded area the white curved surface area equals the difference between the two 250 pi minus 90 pi 160 pi i think that's right yep that's fine okay Right, now this question is actually a tricky one, all right? It looks nasty, it really does. The first thing your eyes are gonna see in an exam is that, and you're gonna go, what the hell is that, all right? And it's a fair question. It needs a little thinking, all right? So let's go through it very methodically. Don't be intimidated, just use the data in the question. So it's saying, that if the balloon is at a height hn, okay, sort of n minutes after whatever, then in the next minute, h n plus 1, okay, it's going to be at this height. So a minute later, the height is based on whatever height it started with, which was hn. And then you bung that into this particular formula. All right. Now, we know the 20, hn we can start with, if you like, what we need to find is this K, all right? And that's the important thing for unlocking this particular question. So let's use information. Height of 1200 at 915, and then a minute later, the height is 1040, okay? Right, so what we're gonna say is that at 916, all right, it was at a height of 1040, we know that. It started a minute earlier at 1200, so that was the height, this thing. Actually, you know what, I'm gonna do that. Height a minute earlier, whoops, 
at 915. All right. That was 1200. And then you got the plus 20 and you got the K there. Rearranging all that, okay, you've got 1040 minus 20. Go over there. That gives us 1020. And divide by the 1200. So just rearranging formula. And you get K equals 0.85. That is really important. That one there. You then have the full equation. You know exactly what you can do with it. So the next minute, you at 916, you started at 1040. Times it by K, 0.85, and then add the 20. And so your height a minute later at 917 is given as 904. All right? And you repeat the process again. So you're putting each of those values back in here. All right? So 904 goes in times 0.85 at 20, and you get your height at 918, 788.4, all right? And that's meters. Um, if anybody is particularly confused about that, drop it in the comments, and if I can try and sort of post a slightly more detailed explanation, I will do. Okay, almost there, all right? And uh, this is not as bad as it looks. Only red sweets, yellow sweets, N red sweets in the bag, all right? So we don't know how many that is, and eight yellow. So the total, all right, is often something people overlook. It's N plus eight, total number of sweets, all right? Take a sweet at random, all right, and eat it. Okay, all right, fair enough. So there's no chance of that one going back in the bag then. And, um, oh, it's a Sajid, it's a he says that the probability of the sweet will be read is seven-tenths, all right, is the claim. Why can't that be, okay? The probability of picking red over total, so it's red sweets out of the total, we know that red is N, so there are N red sweets, and we know the total is, from here, N plus 8. All right, so n plus sorry n over n plus eight is the probability of picking a red sweet out of the total, and the claim is that it's seven tenths. All right, so in order to validate that to actually see if it works or not, we need to find out what n is. So if you multiply, cross multiply that way, all right. So you've got uh, ten times n equals 7 times n plus 8. And that gives us this statement here, 10n, 7n, 56, etc. So rearranging that, you've got 3n equals 56, all right? And therefore, n equals 56 over 3. Now, this is the important bit. It's not an integer, okay? It's supposed to be a whole number. Needs to be, uh, should be, a whole number of sweets. So if, it, if it's not an integer, it can't be valid. Therefore, not true. All right? Three marks, nice and easy. Okay, now it gets a little more tricky and I make no apology for this one. This is the way to do it, unfortunately. Um, and you just got to follow through methodically, right? Step at a time. Okay, after such as taken the first sweet and eaten it, right? Fatso. Um, it's going to take at random a second sweet from the bag and probably eats that as well. All right, second sweet. Um, and they're saying, given that the probability both sweets he takes will be red, right? Both red is that. So this is a given. You're told this. Three-fifths. Okay. What we need to do is to work out. We know the first red, the probability of the first one being a red is n over n plus 8, which we did just above in the first part of the question. Then the second one, the second red. All right. If the first one is a red, the number of reds has decreased by one.
okay? Hence, n minus 1. And the total has also decreased is minus 1, so decreased by 1. So we had n plus 8, take 1 away from it, you have n plus 7. And remember when you have something and something, the times, right? So the first is a red and the second is red. So it's red and red. Okay, so red times red. That's your probability rule. So we take the two probabilities and we multiply them. All right. And I've sort of taken a little bit of a shortcut here. Okay. And I hope um, you'll be able to follow this. All I've done is gotten rid of all the denominators. Okay. So I'm going to take the five and multiply it across here. The front of that side. Okay, so you've got 5 times n times n minus 1, okay? And then the n plus 8 times the n plus 7, that's a denominator on the left-hand side, I'm taking that across and multiplying it on the right-hand side. So I get 3 times n plus 8, n plus 7, okay? Um, and then it's a matter of just expanding everything out, okay? That one is a quadratic n squared plus 15n plus five, uh, 56, sorry, there. And on this side, you've got n squared minus n times 5, so 5n squared minus 5n, okay? Put everything in, um, like, its simplest form, so 3n squared on the right-hand side, plus 45n plus 168, 3 times 56, 168. And there's no excuse for getting these numbers wrong because you've got a calculator available, all right? Okay, put everything onto one side, whichever way you prefer, and get it into a quadratic form. All right, 2n squared minus 50n uh, minus 168 equals 0. That's your quadratic. And divide everything by 2. Okay, divide by 2. So get n squared minus 25n minus 84. And it comes out to be n plus 3 when you factorize. And times n minus 8. So n plus 3, n minus 8 equals 0. And therefore, we know that either n plus 3 equals 0. So n plus 3 equals 0. Or n minus 28 equals 0. If n plus 3 equals 0, then n must equal minus 3. And if n minus 28 equals 0, then n equals 28, right? We can't have n equals minus 3, yeah? Can't have negative sweets, all right? So therefore, the answer must be 28, n equals 28. And that was the actual question. Work out the number of red sweets in the bag, okay? So that's 28. Right, I think we've got this one or two left here. Almost there. And uh, right, number 21. The graph shown below, whatever. And f of minus x, all right, is simply a reflection in y axis. Okay? Just to highlight the difference, minus f of x is reflection in x-axis. Okay? So don't mix that up. This is minus x inside the brackets. Okay? That's really important. f of minus x. All right. Hopefully that's clear enough. And then you just sketch... The best way to do this, by the way, is look at the points, right? Key points that you need to touch and duplicate them on each side and just try and do as smooth a curve as you can, all right? Okay, this next one. Curve C with equation y equals 5 plus 2x minus x squared is already drawn for you, all right? 
um, that's this one here, okay? Transform by translation to give curve S such that the point 1, 6 goes to 4, 6, okay? So the whole thing is just basically staying at the same height, but as you can see, it's the x value is increasing by 3, so you're moving it right by 3 units, all right? Now, if you remember the transformation rules, and I'm going to do a video on that uh, later on, so watch out for those graph transformations of graphs here. Okay, then a move to the right is actually shown by uh, x minus 3 in the brackets, okay? Not x plus 3, okay? f of x plus 3 actually moves left by 3. And it's counterintuitive, right? Uh, but don't fall into the trap thinking it's plus 3, so you just put x plus 3 in the brackets. No, it's actually the opposite. It's x minus 3. All right. So what we now do is remember your original function was y equals 5 plus whatever you're putting into it. Oh, sorry. Actually, you know what? Let's rub that out. And minus, oops minus x squared, right? So in each case, we're going to replace the x and the x squared with my, uh, sorry x minus 3 and x minus 3 squared. So wherever there's an x, it becomes x minus 3, all right? So just patiently uh, you know, expand all the brackets out. So here we've got 2x minus 6, and then a minus, and then everything inside the brackets is a square of x minus 3, so x squared minus 6x plus 9, right? And now here is the really important bit, okay? Got to watch out for this. Your minus minus becomes a plus. And then the, the minus and the plus there is a minus, okay? Watch the signs. Don't be careless about signs when you're expanding brackets. So all of that put together, right, is 8x minus 8, uh, sorry, x squared minus 10, right? And it doesn't really matter what order you write it in. You could do minus x squared plus 8x minus 10. You could do, um, yeah, I don't know, that's fine. Whatever order, really. It makes no difference at all, okay? Um for that question there, four marks, all right? So there is quite a bit of working for it, okay? So watch out for that, transformations of graphs. And then finally, this one, I think, is the last one, all right? And it is not easy. This one is not easy at all, so let's talk through it properly. Circle, center, origin, tangent to C, all right? Passes through the points. You've got two points there, all right? And I've done a little sketch uh, of the circle, roughly speaking. And remember the tangent at P, okay? Um, it, it goes through the point minus 20, 0, and 0, 10. Okay, that one there. Now, what I did first was I sketched the line, because I know the line goes like this roughly speaking, okay? And I realized that the only place, if you have a circle at the center, the only place it can be a tangent is somewhere along there, all right? Um, that's where, you know, you just do a little bit of thinking ahead and do a sketch, that really helps. So must sketch, okay? I tell all my students, whenever you get a maths question with geometry or anything in that, sketch it. It is so much easier to see what you're doing and what you need to work out. Okay? All right. They want the equation of C, the circle. The main thing that we need, remember that the equation of a circle is given by 
x squared plus y squared equals r squared. In GCSE, you will not be given circles that are not on the origin. In other words, it will always be on the origin. In GCSE, IGCSE. All right. Uh, so bear that one in mind. So all we really need is r squared. How do we find r squared? So we want that distance there. Okay, that's your r, basically. All right. Um, okay, got it. Let's uh, just run on there. Gradient of the tangent we know is half, all right? Because if you use that, uh, sorry, skipping a little, um, the triangle there, you've got 10 height and 20 is the width. Therefore, the gradient is effectively 10 minus 0 over 0 minus minus 20, keeping it consistent. Remember, y2 minus y1, x2 minus x1. We've already seen that earlier in the paper, and that gives you a gradient of half. Now, this is, again, really important. The radius, all right, radius in any circle, the radius uh, meets a tangent at 90 degrees. Always, that's a rule, okay? Therefore, the, um, tan uh, the gradient of the radius itself must be 1 over, so minus 1 over a half, okay? That's minus 2. The rule is flip upside down and oh hang on now let's not do it right that and reverse the sign for perpendicular gradient so if you've got a certain gradient and you then want to find the perpendicular so for example if i have 4, I flip it upside down and change the sign. If I have minus one third, it becomes 3. Okay? Etc. Um, if anybody wants any extra detail on that or a video on straight lines and uh, gradients and things, let me know, please, in the comments. Right, let's try and finish this one off. Um, so we've got the gradient of the radius. The equation of the radius line is going to be just straightforward y equals minus 2x because it goes through the origin. There's no y-intercept. All right. And the equation of the tangent is y equals half x plus 10. Okay, because remember the y-intercept is 10. Why are we doing this? Right, the purpose of finding these two lines is we want to find the coordinates. Oops, we want to find the coordinates of P, right? Because that's going to allow us to find distance from center, which equals your radius. All right, that's why we're going to all this trouble. Okay, so we want to equate the two lines, okay, minus 2x and half x plus 10, and solve it to find the x coordinate, all right? So rearranging a little bit, I'm going to assume that you can do that bit of algebra, okay? Um, <clears throat> so rearranging all of that, you get x equals minus 4, all right? And putting it into either of those equations, either the minus 2x one or the half x plus 10, and y equals 8. So the coordinates of p, p is actually at minus 4, 8, okay? And finding the line segment. So effectively, we've got uh, 
Shall I go to the diagram again? Yeah, let's do that. Okay. So you've got that. So there's a triangle there, right? So like this. Like that. So you've got four. It doesn't matter whether it's minus or plus. And you've got eight. And therefore the radius, okay, using Pythagoras. Seen that in the paper already. The minus 4 squared, right, 16, and uh, 8 squared, 64, 80, all right? So R squared equals 80, and therefore we can use the equation of a circle, X squared plus Y squared equals 80. Just write that out there. All right. Okay, so um, that's taken perhaps a little longer than I thought. Thank you so much if you patiently watched all the way through. Um, if you fell asleep somewhere in between, then go back and watch the rest of it in little bite-sized pieces with a coffee in between. And uh, any constructive comments, suggestions, or any thoughts how I can improve this for you, then please, you know, you're very welcome to drop comments um, down below. Thank you so much again. All right. Hopefully see you in the next video. Take care. Bye-bye.